Hello everyone, um, I'm Carly Lubix and I'm doing my Masters of Philosophy at JCU and I'm really pleased to be here today talking to you all at the inaugural symposium. I'm going to be talking to you about integrated mixed methods for exploring connection and disconnection on social media platforms. But first I'd like to acknowledge the Woolgaruka Bar and Bindal people and to express my respect and admiration for the enduring connection between traditional owners all along the reef with sea country. So the integrated mixed methods approach I'm discussing today is something that I'm using in my research project, which is looking at the interplay between media framing of environmental protection and social media users' response. This study spans three platforms. It's over Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. It focuses on the World Heritage Committee's recent draft recommendation to list the Great Barrier Reef as in danger and the subsequent decision not to, and uses six weeks of data collected across the platforms. <clears throat> For the purpose of this talk, I'll focus on Twitter, which many of you would be familiar with. This is an example of a tweet from The Guardian Australia with a link to a news story from the six-week time frame. It has several interactions on it from Twitter users, which I've de-identified, forming connections or ties. From a network perspective, we can visualise these relationships in different ways, but in the actor network I'm about to show you, the social media accounts or the people or organisations are nodes, and the ways they connect are edges. So in this case, by replying, retweeting or quote tweeting, which is essentially sharing or liking. So this is what happens when we get 100,000 of these connections and map them into a network. So this is six weeks of data collected for the search query Great Barrier Reef, and it has 37,500 nodes or Twitter users, each seen by the tiny little labels, which are done like that for privacy reasons. Um, there are about 118,000 edges, which, because there are so many connections, appear as a grey blob. But if we go like that, we can just focus on the Guardian Australia. We can see the connections more clearly in red. So I can go into more detail about the algorithms used and other methodological decisions afterwards, if anyone's interested. But essentially, a community detection algorithm groups the data together into clusters based on the connections or lack of connections. These community clusters are signified by different colours, plus group names, which is the G, with some keywords identified for that group. So just for context, the box at the top left are all isolate, so that's unconnected users that are tweeting with the keywords. This is quite typical of newsworthy topics. The squares at the bottom right, they're just smaller clusters. But as well as looking at these connections and disconnections at the network level, we can also analyse the text that social media users have provided in those interactions. So here we have an opportunity to see what these actors are saying, but also how. So the, di the discourses, themes, and the discursive tactics. So to tie this all together, this is a visualisation of the integrated mixed methods approach I have conceptualised. So if we go step by step, so it looks less full on, um, social network um, analysis itself is inherently mixed. It uses metrics expressed as num numeric values to give insight into connection and disconnection, but it can also detect frequencies of keywords, URLs and hashtags, and of course these all require interpretation. While there are ample studies using social network analysis via social media platforms, particularly with Twitter, there are far less that reduce the corpus into smaller subsets for qualitative analysis. So when we do this additional step, it helps to enhance our understanding of what's being said beyond the keywords and the information being shared via hyperlink, hyperlinks. <clears throat> With this smaller yet relevant subset, we can then look at the content in terms of the discourses and themes. So what is being said, but also how, by looking at discursive practices. How are we connecting and disconnecting? Plus, as this hybrid approach also includes critical discourse analysis and theory, we can consider the broader non-discursive social practices that shape meaning. So, for example, condensed media ownership or COVID-related erosion of trust may be external factors, but they're relevant to the analysis, or could be. So if we want to take this integrated approach a step further, we could then code this qualitative data back into the network to further enhance our understanding of connection and disconnection in relation to attitudes and online behaviour. Now, there are a few ways to do this, 
But um, this is an example from Williams and colleagues who coded Twitter users' attitudes to climate change into the network clusters and compared these attitudes to patterns of interacting. So, for example, the difference between retweets and mentions and evidence of homophily. In my case, I could code the media outlet's framing of environmental protection and see if there's a relationship expressed by in the comments from users. Do they reflect the, social, the media outlet's stance, but also the attitudes of the other platform users engaging with the story? And while it's out of scope for this MPhil, the ultimate approach would then be to test these findings with relevant stakeholders in the field. Doing this would help to round out the understanding, but also assist in overcoming some of the limitations of social media-driven social network analysis. And of course, as a final point, um, this would all need to be viewed through a theoretical lens, noting this may involve drawing upon more than one social theory. So why, the question that we all ask ourselves. This is just one way to explore connection and disconnection online, but it offers a useful insight into the way we are interacting and engaging with po po political and potentially polarising issues like the protection of the Great Barrier Reef. The human desire to group with like-minded people, homophily, is not new, but creates interesting insights when we consider current factors <clears throat> like concentrated media ownership, a reduction in journalistic resources, the click-driven and attention-focused business models of media organisations, the increasing use and dominance of online platforms, and current concerns around the erosion of trust in information. Currently, time is over. Perfect. Some references. And thanks so much for listening, everyone. Um, does anyone have any questions? Thank you. my first conference presentation, I survived. Yay! <laughs> <laughs>
And so, yeah, and just for, um, to elaborate more, I guess, I've done all the data collection. I'm just up to analysis now, so I'm pretty much looking at the social network stuff and then I'll be looking at the narratives and that sort of thing and comparing them across platforms and um, discursive tactics. So it'll be really interesting to see um, the different platforms and how they compare, which obviously you can only compare to a certain degree because they've all got different ways that they're set up and people use them as well. So, yeah. Um, uh, with that first diagram you showed where there were, I think you said there were Guardian articles, one of the... The one of the clusters yeah, there. Yeah, one of the sort of the spawners of information. Um, with the work that you're doing and, and given that you do, you know, you've worked at Gabrumpa in the past and, mm. and, and things like that and communication is so important, from your perspective, and I know you're just at the, you know, the data analysis phase, but when all of the media went explosive after the decision, um, were you uh, sort of quite happy or with, uh, I guess, the accuracy of how things were being shared or when things were being retweeted? Did you get a sense of, you know, negative sentiment or anything like that um, being put out there more than accuracy? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I did some pilot studies, I guess, like before I did this collection and um, there were a few because I suppose there's two things, it's how the information's getting shared, but how it's framed. And um, I did have a slide, I don't know whether we've got time, but I could give you like a quick overview of even like the, some of the out, oh, it's gone now, but um, so in that cluster, I've gone through and seen who the media outlets were and there's definite um, relationships with who certain outlets sharing information between themselves. Because, for example, my understanding is the Australian broke the story, which was at 9.30 on the, on the Monday night, and then the majority of the outlets reported on the next day. So they had the exclusive, but yet on Twitter, for example, they're not very dominant at all, um, and they're quite... There's a connection with Sky News, for example, and they're clustered together, whereas, like, further away with those... I don't know if you can remember, like, the red and the orange sections, that's ABC and the Washington Post, which I suppose like politically they're quite differently aligned. So yeah, there was some diffusion patterns happening there, but um, Twitter obviously on that channel, not obviously, but what I'm finding is that's more sort of left um, central um, wing sort of outlets, whereas like the quick look that I've had at um, YouTube, for example, Sky News is the most dominant cluster. So yeah. It's interesting. Mm. Hi, John. Hi. Um, thanks. Building on sort of Jess's point about accuracy, are you looking at fake news as a component of what you're looking at? I'm not in this project. I'm not. And um, I must admit, I started off on that and I've shifted more to polarisation and they are very much interconnected and I'd sort of argue that they're mutually reinforcing but it was difficult to look at it in this context because then in order to classify the information as whether it's fake or real, I think in the reef space that's really hard to do because a lot of it is so political. Um, whereas if you look at something like COVID um, for a pro like project of this size, it would be a lot easier to say, you know, if you drink bleach, you know, that's obviously misinformation. But um, with a lot of the reef stuff, it's harder because sometimes it's opinion as well and it's the way that things are said that could be true if you just had a bit more extra information sort of thing. Like it's, yeah, agendas. There's quite a few agendas. Mm. Um, there was a, a um, paper that, or a report that came out last week on um, the Disinformation Index, and that was QUT and another organisation, but they've gone through and looked at media outlets and sort of classified them as in whether they're more likely to share um, disinformation or misinformation or not. So another layer with this project could be then you could compare the results with the most dominant media outlets on each channel and align them to their findings as well. That could be a possibility. And something else, like another longitudinal study, would be to go back and look at 2015 and compare the results, and obviously next year as well at the next meeting, and compare it and get a really good feel for what's actually happening and, yeah, what's getting said and by whom. And mm. My time is done. I can't stop my <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you, Carly, and congratulations on a very successful first conference presentation. I'd now like to... In oh, and actually, I forgot to say before Carly's presentation that please use the Twitter um, uh, handles and hashtags, and also, if you haven't got into the Padlet yet, the QR code there to answer the question, can you please do that?